Hello everybody and welcome to the Winecast. In this cast I'm experimenting with a slightly different format in which I'm combining a wine region and a grape varietal into one cast. The idea for trying things this way came at the request of a viewer who wanted me to talk about either Uruguay or Tanat and I figured, hey, why not both? After all, the two are closely associated and it's hard to talk about one without the other. So, let's give it a try. Uruguay has a relatively short history as a viticultural nation with commercial wine production as opposed to earlier communion wine production by Spanish missionaries and church officials, not beginning there in earnest until the late 1800s, thanks to a wave of immigration that took place a few decades after independence and a subsequent civil war. Immigration was especially heavy from Italy and from Spain, as well as from the Basque country on both the Spanish and French sides of the Pyrenees Mountains and these immigrants brought grapevines with them and began planting and then vinifying the fruit. In spite of the presence of these immigrant cultivars, for most of the following century, the Uruguayan wine industry didn't focus on Vitis vinifera, but on American native varieties, especially from the Vitis labrusca species, and on hybrids that started out their careers in Uruguay as a solution to phylloxera, and for which local palates soon developed a taste. Things began to change in the 1990s, though, with a big impetus for change coming in 1991 with the creation of the Mercosur Regional Free Trade Bloc that involved a number of South American countries, including Uruguay. With the lowering of trade barriers, Uruguayan wines would now have to compete on a more even footing with quality vinifera wines from large local players like Chile, and members of the wine industry had a nagging suspicion that, unless they stepped up their quality game, the competition wouldn't be resolved in Uruguay's favor. So starting in the 90s, the emphasis in Uruguay shifted away from hybrids and, to a lesser extent, American native grapes, and onto vitis vinifera and quality production as the road to success. This strategy paid off, and currently Uruguay is the fourth largest wine producer in South America, behind Chile, Argentina, and Brazil. As of 2016, about 6,700 hectares or 16,000 acres are under vine and producing grapes. While that's a pretty modest size, for comparison's sake, California's Napa Valley has about 44,000 acres planted, and Chile, South America's top dog producer, about 315,000. It's worth noting that 96% of that area is devoted to wine grapes as opposed to table or juice grapes, and the number of total hectares for wine production has been growing steadily. Uruguay is mainly a red producer, with 78% of planted wine grapes representing red varietals. Uruguay's commitment to red production has been a boon for itself economically, and its major export market is Brazil, a country that, though it makes more wine overall than Uruguay does, struggles to make red wines in its particularly hot and humid climate. A much smaller amount of wine than what goes to Brazil, less than 10% in fact, goes to the number two market, the countries of Belgium and Luxembourg that, for some reason, my sources lumped together. And about the same amount goes to the United States, with smaller quantities to the Russian Federation, Poland, and Mexico, among about 40 other countries. In Uruguay, the names of wine regions correspond to the names of the departamentos, or departments, comparable to states in the U.S., that the country is organized into. There are 19 of these departments in Uruguay, with vineyards in 15 of them, but these vineyards aren't evenly distributed, and 91% of plantings can be found taking advantage of the cooler weather near the southern coast in the departments of Canelones, Montevideo, Colonia, and San Jose. Uruguay's vineyard land is also heavily subdivided and parceled, with a strong tradition of small vineyard ownership dating back to the wave of immigration in the 1800s, and currently around 74% of vineyards in the country are parcels that are 5 hectares, that's about 12 acres or smaller. Uruguay uses a straightforward two-tiered system for classifying its grape wines, with the top tier, the Vino de Calidad Preferente, or Wine of Special Quality Tier, abbreviated VCP, representing the tier for quality wines and roughly correlating to the PDO level of the European Union Wine Classification Scheme. Wines made at this level can only be made from vinifera grapes, so no native varieties or hybrids, and have various minimum requirements, like minimum alcohol by volume, for example, that they have to meet. In what appears to be an effort to link VCP wines to formats perceived to represent quality wines, they cannot, by law, be sold in sizes larger than 750 milliliters, nor can they be sold in containers made from anything other than glass. VCP wine usually accounts for somewhere between 7-12% to of total wine production, with a considerable slack taken up by the tier below, 
the Vino Comun, VC or common wine tier. Here the wines can be vinified not only from vinifera but from Vitis labrusca grapes, an American native species as well, with the grapes from the species most commonly being two red grapes, Frutilla, known in the U.S. as Isabella, and Concord. VC wines can be sold in any size format and in plastic or cardboard containers as well as glass. In fact, a lot of wine made at this tier is inexpensive rosé, often sold in large jug or more recently box formats, and made from Muscat Hamburg, a widely planted vinifera grape that does not figure as prominently at the quality level of production. Regulations governing wine production and labeling are administered in Uruguay by INAVI, the Instituto Nacional de Vini Viticultura, or the National Institute of Wine and Viticulture. And according to INAVI's own documentation, Uruguay follows an 85% rule for vintage and varietal labeling for its VCP wines. So if there's a varietal designation on the wine, 85% of the wine must be that varietal, and if there's a vintage date, 85% must have come from the named year. I wasn't able to find, despite much searching, a specific percentage requirement connected to using a geographic designation on the label, but one English language source I found claimed he'd spoken to industry professionals in Uruguay who told him that the requirement to use a geographical indication more specific than the whole country, that is, the name of one of the departments that double as wine regions, is 100%. I also wasn't able to find any specific requirements for vintage and varietal labeling for VC wines, and the impression that I get is that this tier is a catch-all for anything that didn't qualify for the VCP tier, provided that the wine is made from vinifera or labrusca and not from hybrid grapes. And speaking of labels, I should note that on at least three bottles of Uruguayan wine that I've had, all very good, I couldn't find a VCP or other quality level designation no matter how hard I looked, despite Inavi's very clear statement that such designation should be printed in letters that are visible, legible, and indelible, as well as no smaller than 6 millimeters. I've seen VCP designations on other Uruguayan wines, so I don't know what's going on here. Did I miss it? Is it under my thumb? As far as I can tell, the designation on the label is supposed to be mandatory, so go fig and let me know in the comments if you know what's going on or if I missed something. Finally, as far as grapes go, the big dog in Uruguay is Tanat, that makes up a healthy 26% of vines planted and about as much of total wine produced. The number two grape, Muscat Hamburg or Black Muscat, features more prominently in VC level production than quality production. Uni Blanc, also known as Trebbiano in Italy, Merlot, Cab Sauve, Cab Franc, Sauve Blanc, Marcelon, a Grenache and Cab Sauve cross that turns up in the wines of southwest France, and Chardonnay round out the top nine. There are 60-some varietals, both red and white, grown in Uruguay, but the top four of them, from Tanat to Merlot, make up 66% of plantings and 75% of production. Almost all of these permitted grapes are vinifera, along with some Frutilla slash Isabella, Concord, and maybe a stray Labrusca vine here or there. As of 2007, hybrids in non-Labrusca native grapes are not legal for vinification into wine in Uruguay, and hybrid and non-Labrusca vines have been undergoing aggressive eradication since then. I should say a little more about Tanat, which has become not only Uruguay's most planted grape, but its signature grape as well. Tanat has its origins in the southwest of France, so there's that Basque connection again. And indeed, it made its way to Uruguay during a wave of Basque immigration in the late 1800s, with the first plantings transported by a Basque gentleman from southwest France, Pascual Ariague. Ariague's role in the migration of this grape was significant enough and well enough known for his name to become a synonym for the grape in Uruguay. Ariaga's decision to bring cuttings to Uruguay was fortunate both for Uruguay and for Tanat. Since there's general agreement that the warmer Uruguayan climate, along with some other terroir factors, does the grape some favors. And, like Malbec in Argentina and Sauve Blanc in New Zealand, this grape was soon expressing in more interesting ways in the New World than it was in the Old. Though it's done well for itself in Uruguay and plantings there are increasing, it's still more widely planted in France, where it's best known as the main grape in Madiran AOC wines. What role does it play in Madiran wines? Well, funny you should ask, since I had a dickens of a time figuring out what the required minimum percentage of Tanat was in this AOC, and after consulting no fewer than four sources, couldn't find two of them that agreed exactly. So I decided to go with the information at Legif France, the organization in France officially responsible for publishing legislation, including legislation related to wine. 
And according to them, while 40 to 80% of vineyard acreage in Maduran must be made up of Tanat, the actual blend in the bottle must contain a minimum of 50% Tanat. There's no maximum amount that the blend can contain, and there are a number of bottlings in Maduran, often considered top quality, that are 100% Tanat. If it's not 100%, what takes up the slack? Cabernet Sauvignon, Cabernet Franc, and a local grape, Fair Servadou. How does Tanat express as a varietal? It's a big wine with lots of red and black fruit aromas and flavors and lots of tannin, which may be how it got its name. This is usually a big brash wine that benefits from some time to age, but Uruguayan Tanats are usually described as softer and maybe a little bit more elegant than their French cousins, and their fruit expression drifts more solidly toward the blackberry and plum end of things. Like I said, this wine can be very tannic, making it a challenge to drink when young, and in 1991, a significant technological step was taken toward taming those tannins. When Patrick Ducournau, a winemaker in Maduran, pioneered a process called micro-oxygenation, or in French, microbouillage. Wines that are high in tannin are often aged in barrel for extended periods of time so that the barrels will control oxygen exposure to the wine, allowing the wine's tannins to soften while keeping the wine from oxidizing due to overexposure to air. This process can take quite a while though, and microoxygenation speeds it up by introducing tiny bubbles of oxygen to the wine through a porous piece of ceramic while it's in a tank. This process is more aggressive and thoroughgoing in exposing the wine to oxygen than barrel aging is, though it's still restrained enough to keep it from oxidizing. Though it has its critics, it also has many proponents, and it's currently used on a wide number of high tannin wines, like some highly extracted Bordeaux, for example, and not just on Tanat. Thanks for joining me for another wine cast. I hope this cast was a successful introduction to Uruguay as a wine region and also left you with some useful knowledge about its signature grape. At the very least, I hope you'll be more comfortable with and willing to check out Uruguayan wine, or as the locals call it, Vino Uruguayo. Thanks as always to all of my viewers, and if you haven't subscribed yet, I hope you will. Please keep the likes, comments, questions, and requests coming both here and on Instagram at Unknown Winecaster Drinks Wine. I'm your host, The Unknown Winecaster, and I'm out. Enjoy the grape, but always enjoy it responsibly.